Hello, and welcome to this APGO basic science objective video about pelvic anatomy. The objectives of this video are to understand the major anatomical landmarks of the female pelvis, apply concepts of basic anatomy to clinical cases, and to understand how anatomy changes due to patient position and habitus. Well, it's my first day of OBGYN clerkship. I hope this anatomy review is enough to get me through this first day. Student Sam, Ms. Osteo is G1P0 at 39 weeks and has been in labor for several hours. She is finally completely dilated, but still at minus two station. What does that mean? When in doubt, go back to anatomy. This time, it will be bony anatomy of the pelvis. Ms. Osteo's baby has not yet descended into the true pelvis marked by the linea terminalis and the pelvic spines. Zero station would indicate that the largest diameter of the fetal skull is at this imaginary line between the spines at the level of the lesser pelvis. Let's think back to Ms. Osteo. To understand the baby's position, we must know the important measurements that affect vaginal delivery. The greater pelvis, or false pelvis, distributes weight of the abdominal organs, supports the uterus at term, and is bounded by the lumbar vertebrae posteriorly, iliac fossa bilaterally, and the abdominal wall anteriorly. The lesser pelvis, or true pelvis, contains pelvic organs such as the uterus, vagina, and bladder, fallopian tubes, ovaries, and distal rectum and anus. It is formed by sacrum and coccyx posteriorly, and ischium and pubis laterally and anteriorly. Clinical pelvimetry helps assess the adequacy of the maternal pelvis and can help determine if there is space for the fetus. The obstetric conjugate is the narrowest fixed distance through which the fetal head must pass vaginally. It cannot measure clinically due to the presence of the bladder. The diagonal conjugate is the distance between the lower portion of the pelvis and the sacrum anteriorly. The obstetric conjugate is usually 1.5 to 2 centimeters shorter than the diagonal conjugate. The obstetric conjugate should be at least 11 centimeters to ensure the delivery of the fetal head. So we have a little time. Let's review for the case, student Dr. Sam. What makes the round and broad ligament unique as ligaments? When in doubt, go back to anatomy. Unlike ligaments in other parts of the body, the ligaments of the pelvis vary from the traditional dense connective tissue that provide support between bones to smooth muscle plus loose areolar tissue that provides little support. The round and broad ligaments are not ligaments in the traditional sense. The round ligament is mainly smooth muscle and the broad ligament is loose areolar tissue. They do not provide significant structural support to their connecting viscera, unlike the cardinal and uterosacral ligaments that aid in pelvic support. Student Dr. Sam, Ms. Muscularis is a 42-year-old P4004 who delivered four microsomic babies after a prolonged labors. She also had chronic obstetric pulmonary disease, or COPD, and used to be a professional bodybuilder. And she's complaining that every time she coughs or sneezes, she leaks urine. She also feels like her vagina is falling out. What could be causing her such distress? Think anatomy. The posterior, lateral, and inferior walls of the pelvis are covered with striated muscle. The three main muscles that span the pelvic floor are collectively known as the pelvic diaphragm. This diaphragm consists of the levator ani and coccygeus muscles. Inferior to the pelvic diaphragm, the perineal membrane and the perineal body also contribute to the pelvic floor. The levator ani is critical to pelvic organ support. It is in a constant state of contraction, and without it, the patient can suffer from pelvic organ prolapse. The levator ani consists of the pubococcygeus, puborectalis, and the iliococcygeus muscles. She could have pelvic floor weakness due to a number of risk factors, such as multiparity, large babies, and chronic increased intra-abdominal pressure with coughing and weightlifting. She needs an evaluation of her pelvic floor for prolapse and urethral hypermobility given stress incontinence. So student Sam, this is Miss Venosa. As you know, she has had a long history of endometriosis and multiple pelvic surgeries, including four C-sections. As our PGY2 begins this hysterectomy, what structure are we particularly concerned about avoiding? Okay, let me think back to that anatomy dissection. We want to watch out for the ureter. The ureter runs under the ovarian vessels at the pelvic brim. It then runs towards the pelvis and crosses the uterine artery 
as it enters the uterus approximately two centimeters lateral and inferior. However, since Ms. Venosa has had many surgeries, the ureter can be moved from its original anatomic location to be much closer to the point of transection of the infundibulo pelvic ligament or the uterine artery. Well, since you mentioned the uterine artery, how is blood supplied to the pelvis? Pelvic organs are supplied by branches of the internal iliac and abdominal aorta. The iliac artery branches into the internal and external iliac artery at the pelvic brim. There is considerable person-to-person -person variation in how these branches come off the internal iliac, and as such, the artery can only be identified once it is traced to the organ it supplies. The posterior division supplies the iliolumbar, lateral sacral, and superior and inferior gluteal arteries. The branches of the anterior division of the internal iliac are the anterior pudendal, obturator, inferior gluteal, as well as the branches of the pelvic viscera, the uterus, bladder, vagina, rectum, and obturator muscle. Not bad. So, I have a tubal ligation next. Why do you think I am more concerned with the branches of the external iliac for that case rather than the internal iliac artery? The external iliac artery ultimately becomes the femoral artery. In the pelvis, the inferior epigastric artery branches off and traverses the abdomen. This artery must be avoided at port placement for laparoscopy. Miss Volvinium, you are completely dilated. We're not going to have time for an epidural, but we can give you something to help with the pain now and your repair if needed later. Nurse Sue, can you bring me a pudendal nerve block kit? Student Dr. Sam, how am I going to know where to find the pudendal nerve? Remember, go back to the anatomy. You can find the pudendal at the level of the ischial spines. The nerve crosses posterior to the sacrospinous ligament in close approximation to where the ligament attaches to the ischial spine. I would palpate the ischial spine and inject one centimeter inferior and medial to the spine, making sure to aspirate so I can avoid the pudendal artery and the inferior gluteal artery. Miss Volvinium, congratulations on your delivery. You did great with a pudendal block. We have finished repairing your vaginal tears. We have one last tear to repair near the urethra. Oh no, that hurts! My apologies. Student Dr. Sam, why does Miss Volvinium seem to do fine with a bigger vaginal tear and is uncomfortable with a periurethral repair after a pudendal block? Before you start to doubt your block, think anatomy. The perineum is the area bounded by the thighs laterally and the pubic symphysis and coccyx. The vulva contains the external female genitalia. This includes the labia majora, labia minora, mons pubis, clitoris, vestibule, and ducts of the glands that open into the vestibule. These structures in turn cover the urethra, vagina, Skene's glands, and Bartholin's glands. The vulva is innervated mainly by the pudendal nerve. However, anterior to the urethra, the innervation is by the ilioinguinal and genitofemoral nerve. So this is Miss Fallopian's ultrasound finding. She presented with abdominal pain, spotting, and a positive pregnancy test. So we half diagnosed her with an ectopic pregnancy and plan to go to the OR. Where is the most likely location of this ectopic pregnancy? Remember that form meets function with anatomy. The fallopian tubes are about 7 to 12 centimeters in length and have four portions. The interstitial portion passes through the body of the uterus at the cornua. The isthmic portion is near the corpus and has a narrow lumen and thick muscular wall. The lumen of the ampullary portion is wider than the isthmic portion and has more convoluted mucosa. The epithelial lining of the tube is composed of ciliated columnar epithelium which beat in the direction of the uterus, assisting in the transportation of the egg. The most common site for an ectopic pregnancy is the ampullary region of the fallopian tube. This is because the ampulla of the fallopian tissue allows for the most distension compared to the isthmus portion. Miss Twistova, it looks like you have an ovarian torsion and we are going to need to take you to the operating room right away. So Sam, how is it possible for ovarian torsion to occur? Remember, when in doubt, think anatomy. Ovaries are three to five centimeters in size and decrease in size in menopause. They have several attachments the broad ligament via the meso-ovarium, uterus via ovarian ligament, and the side wall of the pelvis by the suspensory ligament of the ovary, or infundibular pelvic ligament. The IP ligament carries the ovarian arteries, a branch of the abdominal aorta, and the ovarian veins which drain into the inferior vena cava 
on the right and into the left renal vein on the left. The ovary can twist on the IP ligament, which carries the ovarian artery and vein. When this happens, the main blood supply is cut off and with time could lead to loss of the ovarian function. You are right. And remember, the ovary has two layers. The outer cortex is where follicular development occurs and a single layer of mesothelial cells covers this cortex as a surface epithelium. The inner medulla consists of fibromuscular tissue and blood vessels. Whew. I am so glad I reviewed anatomy yesterday before the rotation started. This concludes this APCO Basic Science Objective video about pelvic anatomy. You should be able to understand the major anatomical landmarks of the female pelvis, apply concepts of basic anatomy to clinical cases, and to understand how anatomy changes due to patient position and habitus. Thanks for watching.